Good morning, friends, and welcome to Nexus, another morning online here together. Glad you're with us. Just a few things before we get going. The first is that we're going to do communion, the Eucharist, uh, at the end of our time together. So if you want to grab some elements, uh, bread and wine or substitutes, you want to get those handy, that would be great. The second thing is, hopefully you uh, know about the One for Another matching donation campaign we have going on uh, through uh, of course, the month of March. And uh, if not, you can look back on some of the previous episodes, hear a bit about that. But we've got that going on. And um, uh, hopefully next Sunday at our family meeting, uh, Glenn Pasco will give us an update on some of the specific children we might be helping through these raised funds. And of course, uh, that raises the family meeting next Sunday, March 27th, directly after the service at the Conrad Center. We're going to have an in-person family meeting, bring to us some ideas around uh, some decisions we need to make as a community, some important big next decisions. And so uh, that's where we're headed next week. Uh, I hope you might join us in person for that. But this morning, here we are back in week three of Lent. And uh, of course, uh, this week is all about regret, memory, sin, how we deal with all of that stuff. And uh, I mean, I first got to thinking about this because in 2004, a film was released, well, one of the all-time greats, I think, called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And it was written by Charlie Kaufman, directed by Michael Gondry, and of course, it starred Jim Carrey, Kate Winslet, phenomenal actors. And this movie, of course, it's now almost 12 years old, so I don't want to give away any spoilers, though if you haven't seen it by now, uh, that might be on you. But even still, I don't want to give away too much of the film, but simply to say that this film is a phenomenal thought experiment. It's a, a fictitious exploration of, I think, one of the most fascinating questions there is. And it is this. If you had the ability to erase some of our memories, would you? Should you? I mean, consider what a powerful tool that could be. Imagine being able to get rid of hurtful memories, memories of pain, of regrets, of mistakes. I mean, it's such a fascinating question, and, and the film has amazing commentary on what that might look like and mean. It's a great place to dive in, especially for those of us who have things in our past we might like to erase. But, of course, we lack the tool the film imagines, something that could get rid of memories. And so, as humans, we are left with pain, mistakes, regrets in life. And without a tool to remove them, I'm curious, what do we do with painful memories and regrets in life? And here to me is again where I think art can serve as a useful analogy for us because typical art orthodoxy, now there's some who violate that in fascinating ways, but typical art orthodoxy suggests that a painting should capture a moment or a feeling in time forever. The idea of art is to, to capture something, a moment maybe, a feeling, and exhibit it, that, that feeling, that mood, or person, or event, as if it can be then forever reflected and ruminated on. And I mean, consider the paintings we've already thought about examined in this Lantern series, The Sick Child or Christina's World. I mean, both pieces essentially try to immortalize a moment, a feeling in time that you can look on and reflect on and ruminate on. And before the, 20, the 20th century, uh, most of art was exactly that, portraits of subjects, right? As if they're frozen in time and eternal. Uh, consider this, I don't know what to do with this piece. I just love it so much. This is the Arnolfini portrait by Jack Van Eyck in 1434. And it's just such an odd piece of art to me, but the, the artist was commissioned to capture the couple at the moment of their marriage, their wedding. And this couple wanted this moment eternalized, captured in time. I mean, we do something similar today with wedding photography. And this portrait is an attempt to capture a moment, a feeling, a commitment and make it last forever, something that you could reflect on. I mean, even pieces of art that don't belong to the schools of naturalism or realism, they try to do this in other ways as well. Consider, this is a very famous painting. Katsuhaki Hokesi's famous woodblock piece, The Great Wave. 
And we're left with this image of tension and excitement. The wave right is at its peak and it's starting to curl downwards on these people in this boat. And it captures that, you know, right before something big happens, right as they're courageously heading into this wave, it, it tries to make this moment of tension stand still for the viewer, the tension of that brief moment. And this is precisely what art tries to do. Capture a moment of time, exhibit it, put it on canvas so that it can be reflected on, ruminated on, ruminated on later. And that has me thinking because I'm inclined to think that what can happen in life is that painful memories, regrets in our lives, they often function, I would say, as pieces of art in our mind. Regrets and painful memories can come to be like paintings exhibited on the walls of our minds because our minds seem to capture pain and regrets like an artist captures a moment. And, and there on the walls of our minds, they hang there, these regrets, these memories of pain, always there ready for us to reflect on, ruminate on, even obsess over. Now, of course, there's a popular mantra among uh, people today, certain type of people, that we should live life with no regrets. And uh, for sure, I think there's something, you know, interesting about that. It makes for a, a pithy little slogan to live by, but I'm inclined to think it's a little shallow and out of touch of reality. It's nearly impossible living as a human to go through life without collecting an assortment of painful memories and regrets. And, and science would back this up. In 2020, the author Daniel Pink, he launched the World Regret Survey. It was the largest survey ever conducted on the topic of regret. And with his research team, Pink asked more than 15,000 people across 150 different countries this question. How often do you look back on your life and wish you had done things differently? And the findings were astonishing. A whopping 82% of people said regret is at least an occasional part of their life. A staggering 21% of people say they feel regret all the time. In fact, only 1% of people said they never feel regret regret. For the rest of us, the 99%, regret is something many of us are familiar with. And, and when we travel through the corridors of our mind, these paintings, these moments of regret line the wall, haunting us, ever present, reminding us of maybe who we could have been or the life we maybe could have been living. And so what do you do with those? And you see, contrary to popular thought, our goal in life should not be to go through life without regret entirely. Uh, Arthur Brooks, commenting on Daniel Pink's uh, fascinating study in a column, he says this, Letting yourself be overwhelmed by regret is indeed bad for you, but going to the other extreme may be even worse. To extinguish your regrets doesn't put you on a path to freedom. Rather, it consigns you to make the same mistakes again and again. True freedom requires that we put regret in its proper place in our life. Putting regret in its proper place, there's the trick, there's the, the, key, the key, I think, to all of this. But as Daniel Pink and Arthur Brooke and others have demonstrated, what you really need to do is uh, have an understanding of the different sorts of regrets. And Daniel Pink has identified four of them. Uh, for this morning, I'm less interested in the first two, more interested in the final two, but uh, the, 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 the four types of regret Pink identifies are these. First, there is foundation regrets, something you did that affected the course of your life in a way you don't like. That's easy enough to define and think about. Things like, I don't know, wishing you hadn't got a dog instead of getting a dog. It'll be fun, they said. It will be good for the kids, they said. Uh, the kids will pick up the poop, they said. Right, right, right. I jest, of course, but there's an inkling of truth there. Things we did and now wish we could undo. And there are more serious things than getting a dog and stuff like that. And they can haunt us on a certain level. Why did I pursue this career instead of that one? Why did I end up moving to Ontario instead of staying in Vancouver? Why did I marry this person instead of... That person. 
And there's a flip side to this, almost the flip side of the coin. There's then second, the boldness regrets. And these are regrets about inaction or foregone opportunities. This is that sinking feeling when you don't make an action. So it's regret over not acting instead of the other way around. It's the thing, it might be like, hey, wishing you had asked that person out on a date, but you never did, and now they're married, and who knows what would have come. Or, or it might be that, hey, I could have worked in California, but I, I just I didn't make the jump, and now I'm stuck here in KW. Whatever it is, again, these regrets are, are real, and they can be haunting. But these are less the area of my interest this morning. What I really want to concentrate is on Pink's final two uh, issues of regret. And these are connection regrets and moral regrets. And connection regret is when you regret your behaviors that harmed an important relationship. Maybe it's that friendship you let slide or that nasty gossip about a friend that you spread around, or maybe it was ignoring your significant other to the point that years later you now feel your relationship splintering, or or maybe it's all that time you spent at work and now your children are almost grown and out of the house and you feel like you don't know them, or, or maybe it's ignoring your aging parents and it fills you with regrets. I mean, whatever it is, you regret certain actions and behaviors you did that left a close relationship harmed in some way. And very similar to this, it's very similar, is the final type of regret that Pink identifies. And these are moral regrets. And these are regrets we have because we violated our own values. Maybe, for example, consider you consider yourself, hey, I'm a loving parent and so you regret not spending more time with their kids in their formative years or maybe you consider yourself a loving and faithful spouse and partner but you found yourself in that affair anyway or it could be even simpler maybe you consider yourself a very disciplined and health conscious person but but for that period of time for covid you really let things slip and Now look at where things are at. Whatever it is, there's a regret that comes because we feel like we violated our own values and who we know ourselves to be. And when we have these kind of regrets in our lives, we can end up ruminating on them almost obsessively. And and I'm inclined to think that the predominant question these types of regrets spawn within us is typically something like this. Why did I do that? That is not me, and that decision is not what I really wanted. It's like you think to yourself, oh, I, I didn't want to mess up my relationship, but somehow, I don't know, I somehow let it happen. I, I didn't want to end up disconnected from my, my kids or my parents or my friends, but I, I don't know. I don't know how it happened. How did I let this happen? Or I didn't want to end up being such a self-centered person. I, I really, truly wanted to be generous and kind. I don't know how I let this happen. And whatever it is, we wrestle with decisions that in hindsight, we wish we hadn't made. Decisions and behaviors we don't consider in line with who we are. And why these two types of regret are of great interest to me, particularly during this Lenten season, is because I think they reflect something that is integral to what our faith speaks to. I mean, talking about moral or connection regret is really just another way of talking about sin. And I know that's a bit of a yucky word, but hopefully we've done enough work on that at Nexus over the years. We can stomach that. It's a way of talking about past sins, about our propensity to act in ways that hurt other people, to act in ways that don't align with who we know ourselves to be. And again, I get the stigma uh, around the word sin, but I actually think it's a really important diagnostic tool. And What do I mean by that? Well, I mentioned this last year during Lent, but sin is what? Simply, sin is simply... H-P-T-F-T-U, H-P-T-F-T-U, sin is the human propensity to things up. And as such, it's a great diagnostic tool. And the Apostle Paul knew this really well. 
And in Romans, he gives us, I think, one of the greatest depictions of sin and what it means to live in the human condition. And in reading through Romans 7, it it gives an interesting lens to the nature of regret. It's very enlightening. So he writes this about sin, this curious phenomenon that works within us. I don't understand what I do. I don't do what I want, you see, but I do what I hate. So it is no longer I that do it, it's sin living within me. For I can will the good, but I can't perform it. For I don't do the good thing I want to do, but I end up doing the evil thing I don't want to do. So if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I doing it, it's sin living inside of me. This is interesting because it's like tricky language and I've purposely used N.T. Wright's uh, a translation here because I think it brings some clarity, but, but Paul's using here the language of regret. The language of regret matches up precisely with what Paul's talking about here because so often the language of regret is rooted in the sense that we didn't actually do what we wanted to do. Why? Why did I mess up that relationship? I legitimately did not want to, and yet I still ended up doing it somehow. Why did I not live up to my own values? I mean, that's not who I am. I didn't want to do that, and yet I somehow managed to. And Paul offers us here an important clue about the nature of sin and regret. Regret is often caused because we did something we didn't really want to do. Our true selves didn't really want to do. You know, I'm inclined to think that that there's a part of us when we think of this sin nature and the nature of regrets. There's within all of us, you could talk about it this way, that are sort of agents of chaos. And um, I like to think about it this way. Recently, I was asked to play a game of diplomacy. It's a cutthroat board game. It's just brutal. You got to backstab people all over. And and I was dealt Italy. That's like getting the worst country on the board. So I knew I wasn't going to stand a chance. And of course, my objective, my true objective, what I really wanted was to win the game. But as I got playing and people closed in, things weren't looking good for me. And so despite the fact that I really wanted to win, what I ended up becoming was an agent of chaos, sowing distrust among other people, doing weird moves, trying to sow sow chaos throughout the the world of diplomacy. And, And I think there's something there about all of us. What we truly might want in life sometimes gives way to this sin within us, this condition, this agent of chaos. And I find this as well with, with, with kids, right? Sometimes you see them act out, do things. You're like, why, why did you do that? And I think they sometimes give a most honest response. I don't know why I did that. I don't know. I just did. And, and I think it speaks to our condition. There is something within us that prompts us at times to act out of who we know we are or act against our morals, it's a condition within us that gives us the propensity to things up. Sometimes even a propensity to want to F things up. And and this propensity lies at the root of so many of our regrets and pain in life. And I think this calls for me a really clear understanding, getting right sin and identity. What is sin? Well, first of all, it's not our identity. It's our condition. I think I've told you before that I suffer from bipartite patella. And that simply means when you're a baby, your knee bones in in, in two pieces and then, you know, kind of like the skull and then it fuses together. Uh, mine didn't. So I have kind of like two, two knee bones within me. And, you know, for the most part, it's not a big deal, non-symptomatic. Uh, but it does cause, uh, for me, it has some consequences. Uh, uh, you know, I have sore knees, I walk like a duck, right? There's all these little things that it causes. And, and, and the thing is this, I have bipart patella, but bipart patella is not me. It's not my identity. It's a condition I struggle with that has consequences, but it's not me. And further, it's a condition that... Uh, requires, for those studious among those who suffer with this, a, a daily program of stretches to, to keep it from flaring up. And, and I don't know about you, but every time I go to have my knee worked on, I get the same thing. It doesn't matter who I go to, massage therapist, 
physiotherapists, what's the other people that they do, o o osteopath people, they all tell me the same thing eventually. I'm a bad patient because they're like, hey, this is tight, you need to uh, do stretches, loosen up, that'll help you. And what do I do? I get home, I don't do my stretches, and then it flares up and acts out again. And this is sort of the same idea with sin. It's condition we have, all of us have innately within us. And it requires a program of daily recovery. If we don't, it's something that will flare up, act out, cause pain to ourselves, to others. And you know, I think when we understand sin this way, the idea of sin, it actually explains so much. It explains a lot. I mean, at, at the very least, it gives us a diagnosis for the problem. And there's nothing worse than aching or, or having pain in our bodies and not knowing what it is. There's something about naming it. And I think this speaks to how we understand regrets. Why do I have regrets about decisions I have made that have hurt people or decisions I have made that operate outside of my values and who I know myself to be? Well, because I have a condition, sin. It gives me this propensity to mess things up. It, it's not my identity. It's not what I want, but it's a condition and I need to monitor it. I don't understand it, but it's a serious condition. And, and this has been a big thing for me over the past few years in understanding sin in sort of a fresh way. Here's the thing. On a personal level, I'm not confused about my identity at all. I know exactly who I am. I know my true identity. I am a beloved child of God. That is fundamentally my nature. But I'm also not confused about my condition and I'm not kidding when I say I'm in a daily program of recovery for a condition that I see at work within me, what Paul was getting at. Sin is a diagnostic tool. And if you're out there and squirm at that word, I get it. It's been used in all sorts of awful ways. But it also might be that this is a term that has been bathed in shame for you. A shame that needs to be washed off. But... Ultimately, sin is a confusion about identity at its core. And the thing is, our sin condition has consequences, real consequences. It leaves behind it a wake of pain and regret. And, and when regrets for us start piling up in life like they always do, they become like those pieces of art hanging on the wall of our minds calling for constant rumination. And so what do we do with these past regrets? Because we all have them, right? Well, again, as Arthur Brooks says, our, the goal should not be to try to, you know, take the portrait down, hide it away in some closet, stuff it somewhere. No, 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 no. That's not the goal. The, the goal, you could say, is to reframe them. Change the framing of regret, and our regrets can become moments in time that we learn from and grow from rather than things we stew over obsessively. Again, as Arthur Brooks says, the trick is not to banish the bad feeling. It's to acknowledge it and use it for learning and improvement. If we reckon with our regrets properly, they can sharpen our decisions and improve our performance. But how do we do that? How do we reframe those things in the past we regret, the decisions and behaviors we regret making? Well, I think there's an absolute wonderful portrait of this for us in scripture and it comes after Peter's betrayal of Jesus and long story short there before Jesus is arrested and tried and crucified Peter has this bravado about him if everyone else falls away from you I will stick by your side to the end Peter says and 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 Jesus says to Peter it's not true, man. You're going you're gonna to deny me. You're going to abandon me like everyone else. And, and sure enough, Jesus is arrested. He's standing on trial. And Peter, this is an important detail, he's outside of the courtyard where Jesus is being tried and he's warming himself by a campfire because it's night. It's cool. It's chilly. And he's asked three times about Jesus, people around the campfire. Hey, do you know that guy's here, friend? No. No, 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 I don't know him. Hey, are you with that Jesus group of people? No, no, no. Wait a minute, I swear I've seen you with them. Do you know that Jesus is here, friend? No, no. Three times, Peter denies Jesus. And in that moment, we're given a glimpse where apparently they make eye contact at that moment and, 
and and of course Jesus goes on to be crucified and Peter is left devastated. It's a moment of regret. It's like this painting that's now stuck on the wall of his mind. He he thought who he was was this strong, courageous guy, but he had messed up. He had denied his friend in his greatest hour of need. And then, of course, comes the resurrection and the disciples are reintroduced to Jesus, but there's still, there's still this art piece of regret hanging in Peter's mind. How is that going to get worked out? And in John 21, what we have is, I think, a classic reframing by Jesus. And everything about the way Jesus does this is brilliant, I think. Here's how the story unfolds. When they, the disciples, came to land, they saw a charcoal fire laid there with fish and bread on it. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus spoke to Simon Peter. Simon, son of John, he said, do you love me more than these? Yes, master, he said, you know, I'm your friend. Well then, he said, feed my lambs. Uh, Simon, son of John, said Jesus again for a second time, do you love me? Yes, master, he said, you know, I'm your friend. Well then, he said, look after my sheep. Simon, son of John, said Jesus a third time, are you my friend? Peter was upset that on the third time Jesus asked, are you my friend? Master, he said, you know everything. You know I'm your friend. Well then, said Jesus, feed my sheep. I'm telling you the solemn truth. When you were young, you put on your own clothes and went about wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And he said this, of course, to indicate the sort of death by which Peter could bring glory to God. And when he had said this, he added, follow me. I mean, imagine being in Peter's position. How could Peter not be haunted by regret at his betrayal of Jesus? And in this moment, he's no doubt haunted by regret as well. He's now sharing a meal with Jesus. And this is the thing about regret. It can be more than just this occasional presence in our lives. It can act like a ghost, a haunting presence, this inner voice nattering to us. Uh, Brooks sums up how it works pretty well here. When emotion resides below the level of your consciousness, an ethereal spirit of cognition rather than a solid thought, it manages you. But if you can make the feeling conscious, you can understand and manage it. And I want to suggest that this is precisely what Jesus is doing in this moment here for Peter. He isn't allowing Peter's regret to remain a ghost, remain ethereal, you could say. Jesus brings all of the circumstances around his betrayal into distinct consciousness. There's no missing it here because what Jesus does is, like the night of his betrayal, he brings a fire and three questions. And after a morning of fishing, you know, they're there early in the morning. It's again chilly. And where does he find Jesus around a fire to bring warmth? It's undeniable. Peter can't miss this. And then another three questions. And Peter's been here before. And the questions are the very type of questions Peter had heard on the night he betrayed Jesus with a slight twist. Do you know that Jesus guy, Peter? No, 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 I don't. But, but Jesus goes deeper than this. This isn't about merely knowing Jesus. The real question is whether Jesus is his friend. Does he love Jesus? And Peter responds, he does. And, and what happened around that campfire when he portrayed Jesus was simply Peter acting out of his false self. He experienced the consequence of sin because the truth for Peter was bigger now than how he responded in the moment. The truth, Peter's moral conviction, was that Jesus was his friend and he did love him. And Jesus is reminding him of that. But in his moment of betrayal, he had allowed what? Fear. The cloud, what was true of him. And in allowing that fear in, the condition Peter and all of us suffer from, the sin condition, was right there and allowed him that propensity to mess things up. And what Jesus does in this moment here is reminds him, that wasn't really you, Peter. I know you're my friend. I know you love me. I know you would never want to betray me, but you did in that moment because we all have a condition. And we let fear in a little and then this is what happens. And so Jesus is reframing for Peter his mistake here. And, and I think this is such a key when visiting, revisiting our own regrets and mistakes in life. It's helpful to do 
the same sort of thing, particularly in the company of Jesus. When we revisit our past mistakes and, and regrets, we do so not to wallow in regret, but to reframe it. Okay, there might have been some things at work in here, fear or other things, but I allowed my condition, my sin condition, control over me. But I know, even looking back on my past regrets and mistakes, that my true moral conviction, my true identity is not found in the decision that I made. And that decision, that regret, it cannot own me. We revisit regrets to remind ourselves of who we truly are and what we truly believe. It's like oftentimes when I go to massage therapy or osteopathy, it's like a realignment of the ligaments, right? Or whatever that is they're doing down there. It's just a slight realignment, a changing of the lens. This is what Jesus does. Peter... You're not Peter the betrayer, but you're Peter, friend of Jesus. And now that you know that and have been reminded of that, we can let the past go. And we're free to live and act in the world the way friends of Jesus do through self-sacrificial service to others. But second, what's interesting to me in this exchange is how forward-facing this exchange is. It's not this deep dive, like 13 therapy sessions, you know, deep diving into the past. It's future pointing. There's no excessive groveling or ruminating on the past. The goal is forward. What is done is done. Life moves on. And while the temptation might be to keep on kicking ourselves over and over for our regrets, our past mistakes. Jesus is looking towards the future, not the past. We cannot undo the past, but we can plot a better course for the future. And so it always becomes for us, are we going to allow our past mistakes and regrets to haunt us forever, keep us bogged down in endless rumination and regret, or can we allow Jesus to help us reframe them as lessons learned before we move into the future. Finally, I'm struck by the ritualistic nature of Jesus' response. Peter denied Jesus three times around a fire, and so Jesus lights the fire again. And this time has Peter reaffirm his commitment to Jesus three times rather than disavow his commitment to Jesus three times. There's a ritualistic nature to this process. And I think that's important. We need rituals. We need words. We need events, participations that we can perform. Rituals are powerful because they're sensory. And this can bring us, of course, back to our primary ritual here at Nexus, the ritual of communion and the Eucharist table. And the meanings of the Eucharist table are many and multiple And every time we come to the table, there's, of course, only a slice of it we can get to. But one of the reasons we come back to the table is to reorient ourselves, to remind ourselves, change the frame and the lens on our past mistakes, wrongdoings, and regrets. And one of the best ways to do that is confession. And so before we come to the table, I want to take you through a simple ancient confession. And and this has been part of my prayer liturgy this Lenten season. I say this prayer every morning as part of my, well, my rituals, what I'm doing for this Lenten season to prepare myself to do some self-reflection. And it's a simple prayer, but I think it's a great one to adopt, a great one to use corporately together or on your own. And so I would encourage you for those at home. You can read along here. It simply goes this way, the confession of sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. A simple prayer, and I love that it's corporate. It doesn't always have to be me. It's us taking our place among the many who confess our mistakes, the things we regret, the things we did wrong. A simple way to start our day, to reframe them as things that are forgiven, taken care of, remind ourselves about who we are, who we're meant to be, how we're supposed to live and act and move in this world. Another one that I've been adopting for uh, Lent is the sign of the cross, and I like it because it 
involves the body. It's, it's more than just saying words. There's something to do with the body. And Christians for centuries have performed the sign of the cross and this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, throughout my day and my own prayer, uh, my own prayer rituals and routines, this is part of it. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or more simply, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. A simple way to reorient ourselves, remind ourselves that our regrets, our mistakes, they don't have to own us. They can be forgiven, reframed. So those are some simple maybe rituals and prayers to, to help you as we think about regrets in life. But this morning as we come to the elements of the table, I want to frame it with one simple question in mind. One simple question from Jesus to us, and it's the same question that Jesus asked of Peter. And it's this, are you my friend? And I think for us coming to the table this morning, that is the simple question from Jesus to us as we come around the table. Are you my friend? Are you my friend? And so for those of us who the answer is yes, then we take the bread, Jesus' body broken for us. And we take the cup of wine, Jesus' blood shed for us. And we take those elements and in doing so, we announce ourselves to be friends of Jesus. Forgiven, set free to live how we were created to, designed to, free from the anxiety of shame and guilt and endless brooding over mistakes. Take the elements and know Jesus as your friend. Friends, thanks for joining us this Sunday. I hope to see many of you, maybe if you're watching online, maybe out next Sunday at Nexus for our family meeting. Uh, but if not, we'll catch you here online again for this week. Go in peace.